dinosaur until the 1840s or 1800s, early 1800s, and that if the term hadn't been invented uh, actually until the 1800s, where did they get the idea to draw these animals on this tomb of this bishop? Well, where did the other animals come from? There were animals that were out there, they could look at and they could see them and they would copy them and put pictures on the tombstone. Why not? And why not include a Diplodocus if you happen to have a Diplodocus wandering around Carlisle Cathedral? Well, there's, is there another explanation for how these things got there? Personally, I'm very happy with the idea that dinosaurs were actually wandering around Great Britain back in the Middle Ages. And this is why you have the, the legends of people going out and killing dragons. St. George probably did kill a dragon. He killed a dinosaur. He might well have contributed to wiping out the last re, uh, spe uh, species of dinosaur left on this planet. Rather unfortunate uh, from a point of view of uh, species and biodiversity. But there you have it. So I have no problem with that because that fits exactly what we read in the Bible. If you read the Bible and take it at face value, you find it talks about creatures that can only be dinosaurs. Okay, let's get to the really big one, though. Geology is the big one because geologists will tell us we can date rocks using radiometric dating and we can come up with, with very accurate measures of how old they are and they come out of billions of years old and you can't refute that. Well... It's not quite that simple because there are quite a lot of anomalous radiometric dates out there. And there are also big gaps in the geological column. People tell us oh, the geological column took so many millions of years to like, be, be deposited and it, it's kilometres thick and you've got all these layers and therefore it must have taken a great deal of time. Well, there are actually gaps. We're going to look at those. We're all going to look at, also going to look at carbon-14 in carboniferous coal, which if you know anything about carbon-14 and anything about the carboniferous, it should be a non-starter, but we'll get there. And we're going to do, finish off with looking at helium in zircon crystals. So let's look at some radiometric dating. We need to be very careful because there are lots of assumptions in radiometric dating. You're basically taking radioactive uh, chemicals that break down, radioactive atoms that break down at a known rate with a known half-life. In other words, in half, the half, in half the time, sorry, in one half-life, half of the radioactive compound you have will have broken down to another compound. And something like potassium has a half-life of 1.2 billion years, uranium-238 has a half-life of 4.5 billion years, and uh, something like rubidium has a half-life of actually 48.8 billion years. Now how you measure that is another question, but I'm not going to argue about that. I'll, I'm, I'll go with the uh, accepted half-life uh, estimates that are given to us. But the, the first thing that happens with this is because the half-life is so long in most of these, it's actually billions of years, if you're going to measure anything, you're going to measure billions of years because you've got to, you've got to have a signal that you can actually detect. You're going to the minimum age you can detect with these is going to be at least a million years or so. And the other thing you need to bear in mind when you're thinking about radiometric dating is that radiometric dates can only be used for igneous or volcanic rock. It can't be used for sedimentary rock because sedimentary rock's being reworked, so you get no signal out of sedimentary rock. So the only way they can actually work out how old a sedimentary rock is if there's a bit of igneous rock, a bit of volcanic rock, in between layers of sedimentary rock. So there are lots of assumptions involved in radiometric dating. So as coming from a creation perspective, I think, well, hang on a minute. Let's look at these assumptions. Let's think about this. Can we be so, so certain that these radiometric dates are reliable? And you certainly can't date a fossil by using radiometric methods unless it's a very young fossil, and then you could possibly use carbon-14 on it. <coughs> Let's think about some of these anomalous radiometric dates. In the literature, there are many occurrences where you get anomalous radiometric dates. And I hope Paul Garner isn't going to talk about this when he comes here. He probably will, actually. So I may be stealing a bit of his thunder, because uh, he's going to talk about the Grand Canyon. Well, this is a cross-section of the Grand Canyon, and we've got two features of the Grand Canyon I want to look at this evening. One is uh, various lava flows in the western Grand Canyon, on the uh, Uinkaret Plateau and the uh, ancient basalt called a uh, Cardenas basalt, which is in the bottom of the Grand Canyon. So we've got very old and very young on a geological time scale. And in fact, uh, the ages that are currently accepted by uh, evolutionary geologists, uh, the lava flow is an age of around a million years, so we're told that's the official age, and the, the, the Cardenas basalt has an age of about one and a half thousand million years, 1.5 billion years. That's the accepted radiometric age of the old igneous rock at the base of the Grand Canyon. Okay, well let's actually look at a bit more detail at some of the numbers that are produced because you can do, there are different methods, different radiometric dating methods that can be used 
to give you an estimate of the age of these things. So one is Rubidian strontium, which gives you an age of 1,240 million years. And there's Sumerian nobidium, which gives you 1,655 million years. And the plus or minus is statistical error. That's fairly accurate with, uh, within its own system. The lead-lead method gives you uh, 1,883 million years. And the potassium argon gives you 1,205 million years. Okay, you're going to say, well, that's all pretty old. Well, yeah, okay, it's all pretty old. But remember, you've got a limit of detection with your, with your method when you have a very long half-life, and you're always going to come up with big numbers. It's guaranteed. If you get any number at all, it's going to be a big number. But let's actually put these on a chart, put it on a graph. There's four different methods down here. Rubidium, strontium, su uh, sumerium, nubidium, lead, lead, and potassium argon. And what we've actually got are three different answers. These are statistically significantly different res results. If you apply a standard t-test to these, you can do it yourself. It's very easy to do. It just requires a little bit of uh, statistical uh, knowledge. You come out with statistically significantly different answers. Now, I used to work in an analytical laboratory, and if I had a sample and I came out with three different answers, which are all statistically significantly different, my boss would have thrown the method back at me and told me to go away and work on it until I could get the same answer out of three samples that supposedly have the same amount of of compound in them. The same here. We're, so we're measuring whatever the answers mean, they're not consistent. They are statistically significantly different. So I don't see why I need to accept this method as being reliable when it can't even give the same answer, or these methods can't give the same answer when applied to the same bit of rock. And it's not just this one bit of rock in the Grand Canyon. It happens over and over and over again. That's just, this is one example of a very old piece of rock where the, the method doesn't appear to give you a precise answer. So I'm questioning whether the method actually gives you a real answer at all. Then we've got the lava flows I talked about in the Western Grand Canyon. These lava flows are actually very young. They come from the top, young, young on any time scale, biblical or otherwise. And uh, there were volcanoes up on uh, the Uin Karet Plateau in north of Colorado River. And they've been, they, they produce spectacular frozen lava falls. And geologists consider these lava flows to be Pleistocene age, in other words, only a few million years. Okay, let's look at some of the data again. Actually, it's a bit embarrassing for the geologists because potassium argon gives 1.2 million years. Okay, we're happy with that. But the rubidium strontium gives uh, a, an answer which is 1,000 times higher, uh, 1,340 million years. So which one's right? Well, we know it's young, so it's going to be the younger one. Okay, so an awful lot of this, uh, these questions are actually unanswered. So obviously, for the, for the geologist, the rubidium strontium age is wrong. But why? You know, if this method has to be explained away over and over again, it doesn't just happen in a few isolated cases, can we actually trust it? Are we actually going to say, okay, I'm going to accept the geologist's uh, story about the Earth being billions of years old, years old on the basis of radiometric dating when it does appear to be somewhat unreliable? Okay, let's think about the, the geological column itself. There's a, a location not far from the Grand Canyon called Frenchman Mountain, which has the same sort of layer of rocks, but it's actually easy to see. If you go to the Grand Canyon, you actually have to walk down an awful long way in an awful hot sun to get to the bottom, whereas the Frenchman Mountain is much easier to see. So why everyone goes to the Grand Canyon is a good question, when you could just go drive up with your car and have a look at these rock layers all laid out nicely by the side of the road. But that's by the by. <coughs> Apparently the Grand Canyon is worth visiting anyway, so that's what they tell me. But Paul will tell us about that in a couple of weeks' time. But Frenchman Mountain has the same layer of rocks. And there's a couple of places where there's actually uh, gaps. Here I just put up uh, the classic geological column. We have the Cambrian, the Ordovician, the Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, Permian, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, and Cenozoic eras, going from, on the classic uh, evolutionary time scale, from 500 million up to present day. <clears throat> well, actually, some of this is missing. In fact, a great deal of it is missing here. You're missing actually a, long, a lot of time between the Precambrian and the Cambrian. The Precambrian rock is supposed to be about 1 billion years old, and the Cambrian is 500 million years old. So you're actually missing an awful big chunk of time. It's just not there. There's a gap. There's no rock representing that gap. The only, the only evidence for that gap is a gap. There's nothing, which is actually negative evidence. There's also another gap here between the Devonian and the Cambrian where you're missing the Ordovician and Silurian which represents a, a couple of hundred million years. 